Thank you everyone for being here. Um, so it, it is a great pleasure to have Roger Early Pryor here to speak with us. He's a historian in the Oral History Center. Um, and he will be speaking to us about a recent, relatively recent uh, interview that uh, he conducted with uh, Aaron Mayer. Um, Mr. Mayer is the, was the first uh, black president of the Sierra Club. And um, we're gonna get to hear all about this his sort of life and where all the different places that he has been able to, to be in. And, and as you can see, the title is Inescapable Mutuality of Place, Aaron Meyer, the Environmental Justice and the Sierra Club Oral History Project. So please help me welcome Roger. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for being here. Thank you, Jose, and to the Bancroft for um, offering this forum to help share some of the work that I've done at the Oral History Center and that we do there. Uh, and have done there for since 1953. Um, I'm also really looking forward to our discussion after um, the presentation today. I'm trying to shape these ideas into an article and I will really appreciate the things that you found worthwhile, the things that you thought were unnecessary, what you wanted to hear more of, what you thought was missing or even wrong, and if there's any ways to help improve my storytelling. So with that, I'm delighted today to share some of my work on Aaron Mayer and the interview we did together. Um, Aaron and I recorded a 15 hour long oral history together, part of which we recorded in the Western foothills of South Carolina, and part of which we recorded in his hometown of Albany, New York. Now, on the day that Aaron and I met, the first time we met in person, Aaron walked me through an unkept graveyard in South Carolina where his mother's enslaved ancestors were buried. A few days later, Aaron and I walked through the snow across the Helderberg Escarpment that rises above the Hudson Valley in New York, near where Aaron's lived most of his life. And as Aaron informed me, this was the place where over 150 years earlier, a Southern slave owner named Joseph LeConte had studied geology and went there with Harvard professor Louis Agassiz where they together nurtured notions of, of their scientific racism that they would advocate over the rest of their careers. For those who don't know, Joseph LeConte later became a geology professor at UC Berkeley and he co-founded the Sierra Club alongside John Muir in 1892. Now nearly 125 years later, Aaron Mayer became the Sierra Club's 57th president and, as Jose had mentioned here, the first black president of the Sierra Club. In this talk, I hope to offer a bit of a behind the scenes view of the oral history journey that I was lucky enough to experience with Aaron. And I hope to illuminate two of the major themes that I saw running through Aaron's oral history. The first is the importance of interconnection and the second is the power of place. I hope that sharing this behind the scenes perspective allows us to explore the praxis of oral history itself and attune us to the possible importance of a narrator and an interviewer sharing an embodied experience situated in a particular place, or in this case, places. Notably places that the narrator themselves find meaningful. Now that embodied experience, I would say, might be particularly important for a white interviewer like myself and a black narrator like Aaron. At least I found this to be incredibly important for my interview experience with Aaron, being there with him in person in these spaces. Now to give some context to Aaron's interview and my experience of it, I'll begin with a broad overview of the Oral History Center for those who are unfamiliar with it here at UC Berkeley embedded in the Bancroft Library, and more specifically the Sierra Club Oral History Project, which is now 50 years old and out of which Aaron Mayer's interview occurred. The Oral History Center, the OHC as we call it, is a absolute jewel in Berkeley's crown, and I am incredibly privileged and lucky to be a part of it. We are a soft money research unit affiliated with the Bancroft since 1953, and we operate essentially like a nonprofit organization. We raise the vast majority of our own funding in order to document the history of California, the nation, and our interconnected global arena. And we do that through deeply researched oral history interviews. At the OHC, we're known for our long form oral histories. We conduct interviews over multiple sessions and they range in length anywhere from one to two hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, 
some even 40 hours recorded with a single narrator, such as with our Governor Jerry Brown or with legendary journalist and iconoclast Warren Hinkle. Now, since 1953, the Oral History Center has conducted over 4,000 of these oral histories, which total tens of thousands of interview hours. And amazingly, nearly every one of the interviews that we have a transcript for, almost, that the ones that been, have been finalized, are available online in a digital archive that is available for free for researchers or for the public to read. Now, as I mentioned, the OHC were a soft money institution. And so through either individual donations or external grants or contracts that we establish with institutions, we raise our own funding for our own salaries and for the interviews that we conduct, which results by necessity, something that our director, Martin Meeker, calls our entrepreneurial approach to oral history. Now, that entrepreneurial approach also helps explain a little bit of the eclectic mix of our collections. They range from individual interviews, like photographer Dorothea Lang or former Secretary of State um, George Schultz, who recently passed away, to multi-voice topics and, and projects. Those include um, women suffragists, the law clerks of Chief Justice Earl Warren, Japanese American survivors of World War II confinement sites, medical workers in the early years of the AIDS epidemic, and UC Berkeley's first African American faculty and staff and their experiences as such. We have a number of these kinds of diverse projects. I can go on and on, but they also include the multi voice Sierra Club oral history project. The Sierra Club oral history project began about 50 years ago, right around the time of the first Earth Day, it was a partnership between the Sierra Club, one of the oldest and most influential environmental organizations in the United States, if not the world, and Berkeley's Oral History Center, one of the world's oldest oral history centers that's conducting professional oral histories. The project itself reflects the Sierra Club's breadth, depth, and the significance of its environmental activism as it's evolved over time from education to litigation, from legislative lobbying on wilderness preservation to energy policy, from outdoor adventuring to environmental justice, from California to the Carolinas to Alaska and beyond. The oral histories also add detail and personal significance to the vast sets of Sierra Club papers and photographs that are also archived in the Bancroft Library. Now, over the past 50 years, funding for the Sierra Club oral history project has gone through periods of boom and bust but it now includes over 100 interviews. Those more than 100 interviews were mostly a result of several decades of work by an oral historian named Ann Lage. Ann is a Berkeley alumnus and she began coordinating the Sierra Club Oral History Project in 1974. She conducted the vast majority of Sierra Club interviews up through and even after her retirement from the Oral History Center in 2011. Now, Anne, I'm not sure if you're here or not today, but on behalf of all of us who benefit from your decades of work on just this project, let alone all the others you've contributed to, I wanna thank you for helping make these exceptional oral histories available and um, possible for us to read and enjoy today. Today, I have the honor to walk in Anne's footsteps as the current lead interviewer for the Sierra Club Oral History Project. Three years ago, on my second day ever at work in April of 2018, Ann Lage and Therese Dunn, the librarian at the, the National Sierra Club headquarters in Oakland, came to the OHC with generous support to revive the Sierra Club Oral History Project, begin doing new interviews. We've since been conducting at least 20 hours of new interviews for the Sierra Club each year since then. In 2018, in that first year of renewed funding, we selected two past Sierra Club presidents the first, Michelle Perrault, and she was the first uh, female president of the club since it became, in the modern era, a multi-million dollar national, even almost international organization. And that was an incredible and informative, wonderful interview. Uh, that same fall, if, uh, that same year of 2018, in that fall, I had the honor of meeting and interviewing Aaron Mayer, who had just completed his recent term as Sierra Club president from 2015 to 2017. Now here's, I'm going to share a short clip, and hopefully I won't mess up the technology too badly, a short clip um, in which Aaron talks a little bit about his life journey and his movement into the environmental um, efforts, uh, and, and he would then detail a lot of this over the next several days we spent together recording his life. What's really interesting is that I could not have scripted my travel and my journey into the environmental movement 
than any other way. You, you, one would think that, you know, you had to really lay out a heavily complex character and growth in the environmental movement. You would try to write a script like this and it would be really hard. Um, and, um, but indeed, you know, the reality is, is that my journey, uh, comes from my family's sense of home place and a civil rights struggle, a migration uh, struggle and pressure dealing with the pressures of racism while at the same time maintaining human dignity, but also maintaining a connection with their love of the natural beauty and wonders. A lot. Okay. So those who might be unfamiliar with Aaron, I'd like to share a little bit of a brief summary of his life that was recorded over the course of, of uh, his interview and, and you could read in his transcript. Aaron is a pioneer in the environmental justice movement. And as I mentioned, from 2015 to 2017, he served as the 57th president of the Sierra Club and notably its first black president. Aaron was born in 1960. His dad worked a solid job at General Motors assembly line and also served as a union organizer there. Aaron's paternal grandfather, his dad's dad, had immigrated from Harlem to Jamaica after fighting in World War I on behalf of the Crown in the British West India Army Regiment. Aaron's mother was a nurse who came from a large family with deep roots in rural Western South Carolina at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Now through his mother, Aaron's family ties to South Carolina, the first secessionist state in the Confederacy, extend back into slavery through emancipation and are still strong up to the present. On the far right in this picture, you'll see Zion McKenzie, the great, great maternal grandfather that Aaron describes as a Moses-like figure for suffering through slavery and then bringing his family into freedom. Zion McKenzie was a skilled farmer and laborer. And in the post-emancipation era, he came to own a large plot of land near present day Travelers Rest, South Carolina. And this is still today where many of Aaron's family live and where the rebuilt Golden Grove Baptist Church still stands today. In the present day, Aaron lives in Albany, New York, the state's capital, where he works as an epidemiological spatial analyst for the New York State Department of Health. Now here in this image, you can see that he worked as a 9-11 emergency responder using his GIS skills to search for victims and to help support the cleanup effort of collapsed structures at ground zero. Aaron also used his spatial analysis in his work for environmental justice and even used it as part of his archival discoveries in digging in his gene genealogy to find who exactly enslaved his ancestors in South Carolina. But Aaron himself grew up in Peekskill, New York, about 50 miles north of New York City along the Hudson River where Aaron grew up swimming and fishing with his family. In 1984, Aaron earned his bachelor degree in history and sociology from Binghamton University in the SUNY system, the State University of New York. He also studied at the American University in Cairo, Egypt, and through his time in the US Navy, he trained at the Naval Education and Training Center in Rhode Island. Now, back at SUNY Binghamton, Aaron completed PhD coursework in political science. He soon became a father, he now has four daughters, and in 1988, in order to support his family, Aaron departed his PhD program, ABD, and began to work for the New York State Department of Health in New York, in Albany. Now, by the late 1980s, upon moving to Albany, Aaron's training in GIS, his graduate readings in world systems theory, his family experiences in civil rights and labor organizing, all came together in Aaron's campaign to shut down a toxic garbage incinerator situated in Arbor Hill. Arbor Hill is the majority black neighborhood in Albany where Aaron and his family had moved to. The answers incinerator, that is the Albany, New York solid waste energy recovery system burned trash to produce electricity for the Empire State Plaza, the very place where Aaron worked for the Department of Health. Now, in addition to producing energy, that incinerator also produced toxic ash that blew directly onto Aaron's family and into the community of Arbor Hill. In 1998, finally, after a decade long battle to close the incinerator, Aaron won a landmark $1.4 million settlement with New York State, his employer, on the grounds of environmental racism. That check, that $1.4 million check, came to him personally as the plaintiff. And he remarkably used these funds to promote further his intersectional environmentalism. 
He founded two nonprofit organizations, Arbor Hill Environmental Justice Corporation and the W. Haywood Burns Environmental Education Center. And through these organizations, he further worked towards environmental justice, including work in the Clean Up the Hudson River campaign that forced General Electric to dredge toxic PCBs from the upper Hudson River. Back in 1999, Aaron joined the Sierra Club in a conscious effort to reform it from the inside. Years earlier, while still battling the toxic incinerator in Arbor Hill, Aaron sought to partner with the Sierra Club's Atlantic chapter, then based down in New York City. He traveled down there and presented his, his ideas of partnership uh, against this toxic incinerator, and the all-white room of Sierra Club members at that time rejected his overture, and instead they asked him, have you asked the NAACP for help? Aaron left that meeting deeply discouraged, but gratefully and thankfully, a local Sierra Club group, the group in Albany, did scrounge up early support for Aaron's campaign. And with gratitude, Aaron accepted that and vowed that if he did finally successfully close the Answers plant, he would join the Sierra Club to ensure that it would collaborate in the future with communities of color. As I said, Aaron joined the club in 1999, and he's then since, he's held leadership positions at every level, from local group chair to becoming a, a member of the nationally elected board of directors, and again, serving as president from 2015 to 2017 of the Sierra Club. Today, he continues to serve nationally as an elected member of the Sierra Club's board of directors. Now, almost all of these events appear in Aaron's 15 hour long oral history interview that he and I conducted together. And like the other 100 plus interviews in the Sierra Club Oral History Project, Aaron's transcript is now available online for you to freely download and read. But now I'd like to explore two themes that arose during Aaron's oral history interview, the importance of interconnection and the power of place. On that first theme, Aaron is a systems thinker. Indeed, at SUNY Binghamton, he studied with Emmanuel Wallerstein, who promoted the world systems theory of global economic development with its cores, peripheries, and semi-peripheries. Aaron attended seminars with Andre Gunderfrank on global economic dependency theory, and he read widely about third world underdevelopment, including during his time in Cairo. Aaron thinks holistically in terms of interrelationships. He sees how parts interact with the whole, or if you pardon my nature metaphor, he sees how to get trees together will generate a forest. Part of Aaron's revelations of his early work fighting for environmental justice against the uh, Answers Incinerator was seeing deep interconnection between voting rights, social justice, economic justice, and environmental well-being. Now I'll soon play a clip from Aaron's interview where he links together John Muir's thoughts on the interconnections of nature with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s thoughts, um, but here's some context on that. And this is what the slide you're looking at. Muir's most famous quote is likely, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. That line appeared in the 1911 book that he published about his first summer in the Sierra, but he first put those words down in his personal journal in 1869. Now that was just two years after Muir had completed a thousand mile journey by foot walking from Kentucky down to the Gulf Coast of Florida, walking throughout the former slave states and the recently defeated Confederacy. By, 19, by 1869, when he was first writing these thoughts on interconnection, Muir was the 31-year-old man spending that first transformative summer in the High Sierra. Nearly a century later, in April of 1863, a 34-year-old Baptist minister and civil rights activist, Martin Luther King Jr., penned his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. From that jail cell, before Walter Ruther, the labor leader, had organized the $160,000 payment to bail out King and his fellow nonviolent protesters, King shared his own deepening sense of interconnection about the struggle for social justice and for voting rights. As you see here, he wrote, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of communities and states. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Now, here's that clip of Aaron sharing those themes and how they came up together for him. Again, let's see if I can make this happen. Right, Zach. And I had already begun as part of my efforts of knitting together 
uh, the civil rights, environmental rights, and labor rights background because of my my ancestors and my role in the civil rights, but also as an environmental justice activist, I saw all these things coming together. But also a lot of the environmental injustices these were land decisions and rules decisions based upon elected officials. And voting rights impact the power for you to elect people who would basically make land use and rules and decisions in your interests. So actually environmental rights and environmental justice is a function of our civil society and a healthy democracy. I'm gonna jump forward just a little bit here. So this is where Dr. Martin Luther King's you know, the mutuality of our dependence coming together now fuses up and overlaps with John Muir's, the thread of things. So the words of King and John Muir totally clicked and that, and we then did, uh, during that fusion, uh, you know, cause I had to not only convince environmental activists that this was the path, I had to also go into the venerable civil rights organizations and labor rights organization. And, and, and teach them this new pedagogy and this new vision and this new perspective. Okay. We'll come back to this in just a bit. All right. So that theme of interconnection that, that Aaron talks about there is also something that's reflected in the very first of the 17 principles of environmental justice. Now, those principles were established in 1991 at the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit held in Washington, D.C. There, some 300 Native, African, Latino, and Asian American delegates gathered and put forward these principles. And the very first principle they put forward said this, environmental, adjust environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species, and the right to be free from ecological destruction. Now, the second theme that I want to address from Aaron's interview, the one that probably had the most impact on me personally, is the power of place. Now, in my view, Aaron's sense of self and his sense of place are deeply intermingled. What Aaron describes as his culture, custom, and heritage all grow directly from particular places. And those places, in turn, have shaped Aaron's sense of justice, his demands for equity, his sensibilities for environmental stewardship. Here's a clip where Aaron speaks to the power of place. But it's actually in the words of Wendell Berry, you know, farmers are really the first environmentalists. They're the first naturalists. They're the ones who are in tune with the seasons of the land and their life, their culture, their rhythms are shaped by the environment and the seasons. And my culture, custom, and heritage, which is rich and deep in such traditions of rural farmers, uh, is anchored right here and, it, and begins here at Haygood Mill. My story begins here at Haygood Mill. And it's a very powerful story to tell in the sense that when you talk about culture, custom, and heritage, and being anchored in the land, which is the core and essence of environment, environmental stewardship, you know, reflects also the complexity of the various institutions that shape our societies to this day. And so uh, you cannot talk about environmentalism without talking about race. You cannot talk about environmental stewardship without talking about how mankind live in harmony with the land. And down here, down south, environmental stewardship and farmers in, were the stewards of the land, the slaves were the stewards of the land. So it's a very powerful, deeper dig. And so All right. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, first, you heard Aaron cite Wendell Berry, a white Kentuckian who writes often about the importance of our harmonious stewardship of the land and how today those interwoven threads that had connected humanity to the land and to each other have frayed. Those ideas that the stewardship of land is connected to the integrity and the history of our social relations all attest to the power of place. Now place, of course, refers to a location, a physical geography. And when we're located in a particular place, we are physically embodied in that site. But environmental scholars also describe something about something more about place. That place is not just a physical geography, but it, it's a geography for our thinking. A place can provide a site that holds our thoughts and our memories 
as well as providing a catalyst for inspiring new thoughts, for forming new memories, for reviving lost memories. And preserving one's thoughts and memories is essential to the practice of recording an oral history, the point of which is to help a narrator look back upon their past, share their memories of it, and reflect on its meaning to them. If place can be both a container and a catalyst of thought and memory, then place becomes a way of seeing, of knowing, of understanding the world. Place can, and perhaps should, play an important role in the practice of oral history, especially oral histories about the environment or about people's relationships to the environment or about relationships to place or places, relationships to other people, to other living things that make a place a place. Now, these ideas on place move us toward what some environmental writers describe as a sense of place. Our sense of place is the textured experience, the cultural, social, economic uh, life of a particular location. It includes ideas that the place inspires in us and also um, how the sense about how our sense about nature and our understanding of a particular place exists as much in our minds as it does in material reality. Places cannot help but be profoundly influenced by the ideas we bring to them. That's something that William Cronin wrote. So our sense of place includes, he's an environmental historian. Our sense of place includes how we came to, how we come to understand the significance of a particular place, how it supports our values, how it shapes our sense of community, our sense of ourselves. Our sense of place shapes how we interpret and interact with the world around us and the people in that world. In a 1986 essay, titled The Sense of Place, Sierra Club member and Pulitzer Prize winning author Wallace Stegner, who Ann Lage interviewed as a part of the Sierra Club Oral History uh, Project, a wonderful interview that's titled The Artist as Advocate. Stegner wrote in 86 that establishing a sense of place requires spending significant time there. It's probably time we looked around us instead of looking ahead, Stegner wrote, to learn that place's history and to acquire a sense not of ownership, but of belonging. Stegner opened his sense of place essay with a quote that he attributed to one of his former students at the Stanford writing program, Wendell Berry, which said, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. Now, I just learned this a couple of days ago. As it turns out, that quote was misattributed. It came not from a white Southern writer, Wendell Berry, but from a black writer, Ralph Ellison, in his 1952 book, Invisible Man. Now that quote, both its point about place and identity and its whitewashing by Stegner, even if accidental, provides a fitting transition to explore some of the places that Aaron and I visited together during the week that we spent recording his interviews, both in South Carolina and in Albany, New York. So for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to shift to um, sharing some of these places that we went to and reflecting on, on them and how they relate to Aaron's, these two themes in Aaron's life. In the clip that, that you saw earlier, Aaron mentioned that his story begins at the Haygood Mill. Now that place, Haygood Mill Historic Site, is in Pickens County, South Carolina. It became the location of our first interview session, the first out of five sessions, all of which occurred in the middle of November of 2018, of the course of a week. Back in 2018, when Aaron and I first got on the phone together to plan out his oral history, um, he was in Albany, New York, I in Berkeley. I explained that I would just fly out to Albany and we would conduct an in face-to-face in -face meeting in some quiet location, typically a house or somebody's office. Aaron insisted that we record his interviews uh, in South Carolina and in Albany. And I, I was resistant to this. Uh, I said, Aaron, we could literally be anywhere. We could be in a room anywhere for you to tell your story. I don't think we both need to go down to South Carolina to make this happen. And he said, no, he insisted. You need to be there. You need to experience it in order to understand it. And having done so, I now very much uh, recognize that he was right. Experiencing those places with Aaron became, for me, essential to better understand his explanations of his family history, his ancestry, which was rooted in slavery, in land stewardship, in emancipation, and struggles for civil, racial, labor, and now environmental rights. Looking around with Aaron in these places and engaging in those places in an embodied way with him helped me to look back, helped me to help Aaron look back as he shared his own life story and his own sense of self. For Aaron, place and history and memory and identity were all interconnected. 
This here site is, reflects something that I'd like to point out, which is indeed the whitewashed nature of this, this location. Um, you can see here in, in the, the historic marker that it mentions the people who rebuilt and or built the, the uh, mill and that they worked as a planter and merchant. There is no mention here that they were white slave owners, that the people who built this place were not white people, but their enslaved um, chattel property at that point, humans, black, black men and women, Aaron's family. The whitewashing really, really struck me. There is, um, at the Haygood Mill Historic Site, they're part of the National Heritage Corridor for South Carolina. In all of the imagery and all of the text about the Haygood Mill Historic Site, the folkways, the lifeways, there is not a single mention nor a single image of a black person or the mention of slavery, none of it. I was shocked by this. And I suppose that's part of my own naivete as a white man and as a person who did not live, um, who's not lived in the South. After going to the Haygood Mill, um, Aaron quickly then said, we need to go visit the graveyard at the Haygood Mill historic site. And that's where we walked through this, um, the Haygood family cemetery, these ornate sepulchers and monuments that are adorned with Confederate crosses and surrounded by a wrought iron fence neatly kept in the, in the autumn uh, fall there. Just outside that iron fence of the, you can see there on the left, the, the, the Haygood family, the white family um, gravestones are unmarked graves of the slaves of the Haygood family, Aaron's ancestors. These, these headstones were essentially river rocks that have no names on them and were only marked by Aaron's family when they came to celebrate a uh, family reunion there upon Aaron learning that it was indeed the Haygood family who held his, uh, his own family as property. The experience of interviewing Aaron on these places and being there with him was powerful. And it led, it, it just provided exceptional context to the stories he then told about his own family. Now, additionally, that night after dropping Aaron off after this intense day of interviewing and being in this place with him, um, I dropped him off at his cousin's house. You can see her in the top right there. Her name's Hattie Estella Green and um, Aaron affectionately calls her cousin Stella. Cousin Stella's house is part of that property that the Aaron's great, great maternal grandfather, Zion McKenzie, owned land. And you can see the photograph of him framed hanging on Cousin Stella's wall, along with uh, family images and just this wonderful home, this beautiful space. And as I dropped Aaron off that night um, to then say, I'll pick you up tomorrow morning, we'll go do some more interviewing. Uh, Cousin Stella said, no, 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 you need to come inside and we're having dinner. And she, she's not somebody you say no to. And so she uh, created, cooked this wonderful fried fish and savory vegetable meal for us. And we spent the night uh, staying up and talking together, sharing some of her own story, her own migration struggle from the South to North to New Jersey, um, her, her struggles for education, eventually becoming a, a principal. I mean, she, I wish we could have done, I did an oral history with her. It was just an incredible experience to be in this space with Aaron and to really understand more of his family's history by sharing it with him. And I'm so grateful for the ways that both Aaron and his family opened up their, their lives and, um, to me in that way. The next day, uh, Cousin Stellan and Aaron and I and some other family members uh, attended the Go Golden Grove Baptist Church. This church has been um, bombed, firebombed and burned down a few different times over the course of, of its um, uh, over its lifespan, but it still exists on the ground that the Zion McKenzie, the land that Zion McKenzie founded. You can see in the stained glass window here at the very bottom, there's a mention of the, the McKenzie family, Zion in particular, as a founding father of the church. Um, and that was an incredible experience as well for me. I am not a practicing Christian and um, and that community opened, I was the only white face in the sanctuary and that community just opened themselves to me, allowing me to be there and even recording some of the ceremony and the fire and brimstone Southern Baptist preacher um, sermon was quite an experience. It, the singing was incredible. It brought me to tears. It was just an incredible experience again to share with Aaron. It wasn't something he went into depth with in his interview, but just to get a broader sense of, of the family life and um, culture and the heritage that he uh, did, did share about. After church, the family invited me back to their home where we had fried green tomatoes and, and shared stories, more family stories, just had this wonderful time in their home together. 
And I just can't express enough, um, again, my, my gratitude for it, but, but the, the sense of belonging that I got from Aaron's family and the depth of, of, um, of how place matters to them in such important ways. Aaron had to fly back to New York that day, um, but I, my flight didn't leave until the next day. And one of the other places he really wanted to conduct an interview was at Caesars Head State Park. This is about 3,000 feet above sea level and it overlooks a, a wilderness space in South Carolina, a designated wilderness. This place was important to Aaron because the Haygood family owned property at the top of Caesars Head, what became a state park. And it became so popular that they, meaning the slaves of the Haygood family owned, built a resort there. And it was one of the first sites of ecotourism in South Carolina. Now, Aaron wanted to go there to make mention of his family's history in this, that it was, it was his ancestors who were driving the sheep and the cattle to the north part up the mountain to be there in the summers and also to guide the tours. They knew the botany, they knew the land. They were the ones providing the meals and providing the tourism. Um, but there's no mention of that, not at the state park, not in any of the, the um, commemorations about the, where the hotel was located. It's again, completely whitewashed. Aaron said, look at a picture on the wall. You'll find there's just images in the background, possibly dark faces, possibly my family, but no mention of them and just standing in the shadows. And that's the images, the photographs I took there from the state park. Next, Aaron and I uh, traveled to Albany. I flew up to Albany, he was already there and we met there and that began another phase of his uh, interview. And it also provided much deeper context for Aaron's uh, own personal life and particularly his work in environmental justice and in his leadership of the Sierra Club. Albany is a, uh, an interesting city and um, today, about 50% of the population is now people of color. But in the 1980s, when Aaron moved there, it was only about 30%. And he was raising a family in Albany's Arbor Hill neighborhood. It was a majority black neighborhood and at the time disinvested. The pictures that you see here is Aaron standing in front of the answers incinerator that he, um, that, that is located in a hollow just, a, just below at the base of Arbor Hill. So that giant smokestack that was spewing toxic ash was then because of the wind patterns blowing directly into the hill, just to the side of that where Aaron's family was, where this black community was located. Um, and on the right, you can see a, a land that Aaron helped reclaim as part of his activism at Arbor Hill. Um, that's a, a recreation space. There was not recreation space for his children to play in Arbor Hill. They had to go to the white neighborhoods in order to play sports and they were mistreated there because they were black. And so Aaron worked with the community there to reclaim a, a park that had been just fallen into disrepair and was the site of uh, murders and drug deals. Uh, and he built it, he, he captured funding and grant money to help build it into uh, a pretty amazing um, park today. So Aaron would drive me around to these different places and, and share some of his stories that he was not only recording, but then telling me additional stories as we were driving in the car and he was getting out and pointing me to these things. Being again embodied in these places with Aaron added a great deal to my understanding and my experience with him and also the camaraderie that we developed together and the affection that I grew to, to really have in in him sharing these vulnerabilities with me and his own life story and him opening uh, himself up to me in that way. And that's part of the reason why I, I say Aaron and I'm not saying Mr. Mayor or Mayors. It, feel, it would feel weird for me to, to call somebody that you spend so much time with and so, so much intimate time with anything but their name. So um, that's, that's why I've been saying Aaron for this whole talk. Aaron also then took me to the sites of where the Arbor Hill Environmental Justice Corporation was and this education center that he used this $1.4 million check to, to produce. And he, we recorded the majority of our interviews in the Atlantic chapter headquarters for the Sierra Club. It moved from New York up to Albany so it could be there in, in terms of lobbying on behalf of uh, the Sierra Club for the state government in New York. And it was in um, the Sierra Club headquarters that we conducted most of our interviews, um, all of our interviews in Albany. On the last day of our interviewing, Aaron met me during his lunch break at the Helderberg Escar Escarpment in New York. And this again is the site where Joseph Lacan, a South Carolinian, what, a professor in South Carolina um, who had worked on behalf of the Confederacy, who owned slaves, who worked in the powder works, who built bombs and cannon fodder 
to um, on behalf of the Confederacy during the war and who later became a professor of geology at Berkeley. Um, this is where, where Joseph Lacan studied and trained in geology was in these very hills outside of Albany, New York. So Erdin and I walked there together and this all for me really brought together the importance of the power of place and the stories of interconnection that for Aaron being in this place was totally deeply interconnected with his own efforts to help transform the Sierra Club, to have it become more open to people of color, to focus on efforts in creating, for example, the Department of, of um, Equity, Inclusion and Justice at the Sierra Club. So that story about Joseph Lacan, um, Aaron really saw as totally part of his own story and deeply connected to his own, the places in his life and also the, the efforts he'd, he had as an environmentalist uh, in the Sierra Club. I'll conclude here and then transition for us to have some discussion um, by saying that any successful institution that's nearly 130 years old, like the Sierra Club, has to adapt and evolve over time to survive. Now the Sierra Club Oral History Project itself provides an extraordinary lens on the evolution of the club over time, but also the changes in US environmentalism broadly. Both the Sierra Club and American environmentalism are currently going through the process of change and evolution to meet the needs of society, to ensure its own survivability, and to better fight for the survivability of much of life on earth. We're all learning, as Margaret Atwood once wrote, that climate change is everything change. Aaron Mayer's leadership in the Sierra Club is reflective of this necessary and important process of change that the club is currently experiencing, especially on issues regarding race, both the Sierra Club's deep history and for its future. I'm delighted that I had the opportunity to meet Aaron, to record his life history, and so that others in the future can learn the lessons and relate it to their own present moments. As an oral historian, my job is to help narrators record their life history, to look back on their past. But through Aaron's focus on interconnection and through his sense of place, he helped me see how much we can learn when we join our narrators in looking around. So with that, I'd love to hear your own thoughts. Thank you. Does anyone have anything they would like to share? or any questions you have. Well, I think we, thank you, Roger. This was fantastic. Um, we have one uh, from Christine uh, in in the chat. I don't see the chat. Can you read it for me? Or Christine, yeah, can you jump on? for sure. Or yeah, if Christine wants to volunteer, she's welcome to. No, all right, I can read it. Um, so again, thank you. And so I believe the question is to what extent, oh, uh, I can see the centrality of place in this particular interview, but I imagine the same is true for most uh, every interview. To what extent are you and your colleagues able to travel to your subjects' homes? Yes, Christine, that's that's exactly where a lot of this stuff was coming up for me. We are recording our interviews now over Zoom. And so that embodied experience that we have is disaggregated, it's separated. I mean, I'm here in my garage in Santa Rosa and I could be talking to somebody in Washington, DC as the riots are happening in Capitol Hill around the corner from them. And that separation of place does something to, I think, what could be the oral history experience for both of us. Um, and so that's part of why I, what I took really away from my interview experience with Aaron was that there, I think, is something to be said about being in a place with someone. And I thought it was especially important for me as a white man to be in these black spaces with Aaron in the South. And then to be conscious of the fact that when we went to Albany, New York, we were in almost entirely white spaces. The Sierra Club mm -hmm. itself was entirely white. Um, so yeah, the, 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 I think, I think you're, you're right on the money there with thinking about the importance of place, but um, what that could do to an oral history, especially in the era of Zoom interviews, uh, I think is an open question for us to talk about. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you can see, there's another one. Um, perhaps, I think if you stop the sharing, you can it, see, yeah. I can see. Um, uh, did I get to talk to Aaron about the new acknowledgement by the club regarding Muir's views of native people? And um, yeah, so, okay, cool. No, the interview, well, yes, yes and no. The interview itself, the transcript happened before um, 
before Michael Brune had published that Pulling Down Our Monuments um, blog post this last summer. But Aaron and I talk, have talked about it. And so I, it's, you know, I called him to, to get his take on it. And the, the take that I got from Aaron was more what's evolved is the nuanced view. I don't know if you just saw in the Atlantic this past week, they're doing this incredible series on who owns America's wilderness. And there's a really wonderful um, article by a woman named Michelle, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Um, it's about John Muir and it says, don't cancel Muir, but also don't give him a pass either. I mean, it's really a wonderful nuanced take to say, let's take the good things from Muir and, um, and not, not just throw him under the bus. Now that said, I am totally happy to throw Joseph Lacan under the bus. <laughs> As you <laughs> have guessed from my, <laughs> the way I presented this history. Um, but Muir himself, I think, does require, based on, on his journals and what um, most biographers of his that I've seen, his, their take on it, and that's the same take that Aaron had uh, with me, is that we need to uh, understand Muir in the context of what he said and how he evolved over time. And I think that's in some ways a model for what how um, Aaron sees the club evolving over time in some ways too, learning from its mistakes. Lisa, would you like to add your, ask your question or would you like me to ask for you? Uh, you can ask it. Yeah, um, I, I can see oh, it. Now. You can see it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so, um, did he talk about his efforts to increase membership in Sierra Club of People of Color? Yes. Yeah. One of the big things Aaron did in his presidency was he um, he made an, a conscious effort to try to visit each chapter of the club, which there's a lot of chapters in the club. And he went there and when he did go, he would give a presentation that was a lot about his own life history. He would use that, that uh, combination of John Muir's words and Martin Luther King's words to talk about the intersectionalism of environmentalism to try to bring what he called that new pedagogy on environmental uh, understandings and, and its connections with social justice, with labor rights, with voting rights, with economic equity. And so he said that that was all part and parcel of his efforts and his clear recognition, the importance of being the first Black Sierra Club president. And when he went to those chapter meetings, he said, he asked those chapters to reach out to the, the local NAACP chapter and invite their president to come and attend the talk. Um, and so he, he, in his interview, he talks a good deal about um, ways that he tried to help integrate and broaden the membership of the club, including marching on behalf of labor activists in Mississippi, mostly Black um, car manufacturers working, I think, at a Nissan plant. And the fact that Sierra Club members were there marching with them um, in the South uh, for labor rights, that was, again, part of his effort to try to broaden the movement of the Sierra Club and its concerns about environmental issues that are much broader than just um, what people would say is staying in your lane on wilderness preservation or conservation. Okay, another Roger. question. Go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. I'm just uh, when you were talking about sort of shaping this into an article, can you sort of mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about that? You said you'd wanted some some critiques. I'm curious if you can tell us more about what you, how you sort of see this being shaped and what you would like to see out of that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I think that the, the journal that I'm trying to go for for this right now is the oral history review. And so not just sharing what I did today about Aaron's life um, and highlighting these two themes that I saw in it, but but also talking about the way that the importance of place um, played out in the oral history, the, the points that kind of at the end that we're getting at around in this era of Zoom interviews, what do we think about being, what's to be gained and what's to be lost about not being in person and sharing a, a space and a place with someone? Um, and so that, that's, that's where I'd like to develop some of these thoughts um, and talk more specifically almost my own experience and what I gained from, from what Aaron taught me about being in these places with him and what that added to my sense of what the interview was about and my understanding of him as, as an individual. Yeah. Uh, do you think There's the interview a... would have been different if you were, if I was African American? I think so. Um, I'm, I'm sure it would have, I would think. If I was a woman, I'm sure it would have been different. I mean, I guess, yeah, that's the, always the case with any interview. I mean, that we can't not bring ourselves to it. And that's part of why oral history, we, we talk about the co-construction of an, an oral history, that it might be about that narrator, but you can't separate the interviewer from it. Um, 
I don't know how it would have been different. I think, I think Aaron did a lot of teaching of me, instructing me, bringing me along um, to shed some light on his, in his interview. And honestly, I think that was a really good thing for the interview itself so that it can, it can reach a broader audience um, and educate more people like myself who, who um, wouldn't understand some of the depth of experience as a black man that he has. Um, but at the same time, I'm sure there's so much that's lost that there could have been a, a greater depth and honesty of, of shared experience in some ways that could have shed a completely different um, light on Aaron's experiences and different stories that he might tell. So um, even though it was a long 15 hour interview, uh, I mean, th there could be hours and hours, days and days of more interviews uh, where Aaron would, would tell totally different stories, maybe even the same topics, but in different ways with a different narrator or different interviewer. That's a great question. Anybody else have anything that they're interested in or anything they want to share about the presentation itself? Well, again, I want to thank everyone for being here today um, at a lunch hour. And um, I especially want to thank Jose for the opportunity to present, to the Bancroft for making this forum possible, and especially to the Sierra Club for making the Oral History Sierra, the Sierra Club Oral History Project possible. And of course, the Oral History Center. I'm just incredibly lucky to be a part of it, to work with such incredible colleagues. Um, yeah, I just feel really blessed and grateful for it. So thank you everyone for being here today. Before we go, I, I, there is a really wonderful um, question from Amanda, who um, on on sort of on what on mm -hmm. you're reflecting on what you just said about about uh, on Marjorie's question. So uh, on what you feel that you bring now to from this interview to other interviews, um, and I think if you can maybe just before we go, if you can sort of touch on that, because I think that that's a really good reflection on on yeah. what you had just answered. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Um, gosh, <laughs> there is there are things to be gained from Zoom too. I mean, the fact that they can be in, in a space of their own choosing and their own control in a way that's different from having to host me in that space. Um, the ease of just coming in and out of an interview, clicking a button and boom, clicking it off and being done with it. Um, and there's an ease for me too in that, I and mean, for us to not have to like drive to their place and to have to ask, you know, where's the bathroom and and all the the oddities that go through being in a shared space with someone. Um, so yeah, there there are there's much to be gained, and there's also you know as you mentioned the financial aspect. There's there's savings to be had from travel expenses and carbon output from flights. I mean, there's there's lots of positives and negatives to both sides. Um, but just as much as if I was a woman or if I was a, was a person of color doing this interview with Aaron, it would have been a different interview. Um, it would be different over Zoom and it would be different in person. So uh, with all things, there's, there's, to be, um, there's gains and losses in that. So I don't know if that, that gets it where, some of where you're coming from, Amanda. Yeah, I was just curious. I know this is something we are definitely thinking about in the, this era of Zoom, but, when we have these really extraordinary interviews that resonate with us on a personal level and clearly an intellectual level for you too, I'm always curious what I can take from one of these interviews into the next one and if any of it truly is applicable in, a, in different situations. So I was just curious if you thought about that aspect. Yeah, you know, with the Sierra Club interviews in particular, so many of the people I interview are outdoorsy types and I, I there's, I don't know, my own experience of hiking and backpacking with people, it's just a different shared experience to be um, hiking with, with people. And so I would love the opportunity to, to have hiked with other people like Aaron and I did through the uh, Heidelberg Escarpment and the stories that came up from just being out in the wilderness or in the, in the woods together. As far as the content of things that I took, I mean, certainly not so much place-based, but just the stories that he told and the things that he taught me about uh, environmental justice, for example, it was really my first entry into learning about it. I've taken that very much with me to all of the other Sierra Club interviews I've done and, and focused on making sure we talk about that, to have that be a piece of the record that we have in the, in the oral history project. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Roger. Uh, this was this was fantastic. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I'll be sending out a reminder for our next one. But thanks again. This was fantastic. And uh, yeah, great to see everyone. Great. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Take care, all. Be safe.